Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Hacks. This is Mill Skills, a series of quick videos on getting started with your vertical mill. For the fundamentals of machining in general, check out my Lathe Skills series. But if you've just bought a mill, then this is the series for you. This is episode three, Making Chips. Let's dive in. So last time on Mill Skills, we talked all about how to tram your head and how to install and indicate your vise. And uh, if you haven't done that yet, you definitely need to go back and watch that because we also talked about the physics of vices and the various important relationships in the body of the vise and how those can affect your work. All right, all right, enough science. Let's uh, get to what you really want to talk about, which is the cutters. Now, milling cutters are uh, really where all the technology in the vertical mill is. The, the mechanics of the mill itself are the same as the lathe. It's a spindle and some slides, and you know, that's 100 and something year old technology. Uh, but end mills are amazing, and they are the reason that the vertical mill came along relatively late in the machining technology curve. You know, before vertical mills, we had things like planers and shapers for making flat and square stuff, and they're single point cutting tools similar to the lathe. You know, they have creative ways of moving a single point cutter across the work or moving, in the case of a planer, the work under a single point cutter, just like the lathe does. But the, the advent of the technology to make multi-point cutters like these guys are what made the vertical mill possible. So I've got them sorted here left to right in what is, let's face it, the order that you're going to buy them. All the way on the left here is your standard set of cheap import end mills. And they are high speed steel and they are very tempting because you get a set of like six of them for 40 bucks. And uh, the problem with these guys is, well, that they are garbage. Uh, the, the value proposition in them, however, is that when you're getting started, you are trying to learn all of the various skills in machining and you're gonna mess up some end mills and you also don't know which sizes of end mills you really need or which types, there's different flute counts and all these different things. So uh, there is an argument to be made that it's worth buying one set of these crappy ones uh, and uh, just to kind of get your feet wet and then figure out, uh, first of all, if this is really for you and second of all, you know, uh, it helps you learn what to look for in, in quality end mills. Uh, if, uh, if we were doing everything really the best way, I would say don't even bother with the cheap end mills because it's so much easier to get nice results with the quality uh, end mills. Quality tooling matters, I think, a lot more on the mill than it does on the lathe. But uh, let's face it, you're going to buy a set of these because everybody does. I mean, 40 bucks. Now compare that to quality mills, which can be, you know, hundreds of dollars a piece. Uh, and you can see why the temptation is so strong to buy those sets. Now, you don't have to go all the way uh, that crazy. Uh, there are, you know, extremely high quality tools like your, you know, your Kenna Metal and your Sandvik and your Niagara. Uh, but you can also buy kind of prosumer cutters like these guys. These are Hertel, which is now a house brand of MSC Direct. Uh, hashtag not sponsored. Uh, but, you know, these guys are uh, 40 bucks ish a piece, uh, and they are just night and day better than, you know, your cheap Chinese ones. So there is a little bit of middle ground. You don't have to go all the way to your pro industrial cutters. So after you've broken and dulled and gotten sick of the cheap ones, you're going to buy a few nice ones, and you'll learn that you don't actually need that many sizes. You know, here's a set of, of half inch end mills, and honestly, I do 90% of my work on the vertical mill with these guys. Now, end mill geometry is an extremely complicated and detailed subject you could spend years learning but uh, since this is a home hobbyist youtube channel i can give you the very basics that that are is it really all you need to know in the home shop uh, so this is a roughing end mill it's got kind of that corn cob appearance to it you can take more aggressive cuts with this guy it leaves a slightly worse finish and then these are your finishing end mills and uh, these guys come in basically two and four flute versions. There's, there's others, you can get three flute and eight flute and all kinds of different things. But generally speaking, uh, the two flute is good for softer metals like aluminum and brass that need a little more time to get out of the way of the cutter. And then four flute is gonna be better for uh, steel and uh, things like that. And then as you get into different projects, you'll find you might need a few specialty mills. So, you know, I needed a, a very long quarter inch end mill for uh, a deep slot I had to cut. Uh, this is a, uh, a ball end mill, you know, for making little inside fillets and things. And then this is a, a carbide uh, chamfering mill. So, you know, for making uh, bevels on things. 
And then the last sort of major category of cutters that you need to think about are kind of your facing tools. And uh, you can buy like big facing mills that take expensive, complicated carbide inserts. Uh, I personally don't think those are a great fit for small hobbyist machines that you might have at home. Uh, same as, you know, I've said about the lathe, uh, carbide has minimum feeds and minimum speeds to perform well. And uh, home machines just tend not to have the horsepower and the RPM uh, th that you really need to get good performance out of carbide. So uh, I stick generally with high-speed steel, both in end mills and for facing. Uh, I think shell mills are a great option for the home shop. And uh, they are basically a giant high-speed steel end mill. And uh, they are hollow in the middle so that you don't pay for a whole bunch of high-speed steel atoms that you're not going to use. And uh, they work similar to an end mill in that you can cut uh, 90 degree inside corners with them. Uh, but uh, yeah, these guys are uh, a little bit expensive, but uh, they perform really, really well on small, low horsepower machines for uh, facing off large surfaces. And then the other option that you might consider for facing large surfaces at home is the fly cutter. Uh, these are actually really easy to make. Uh, they're also inexpensive to buy, and they are basically just a disc that holds a uh, lathe tool bit, effectively, uh, at a slight angle. And uh, they are a single point cutting tool that rides in the mill. And uh, so they have all the advantages of a single point cutting tool on the lathe in that their tool pressure is very low and you can get very, very good surface finishes with them. But like all single point cutting tools, uh, they suffer from a lack of speed. So uh, fly cutters can't take very deep cuts. They aren't extremely rigid uh, and they have to be fed very, very slow because you're only getting a tiny bit of cutting on a small portion of the rotation of that cutter. Uh, as opposed to an end mill where you know you're cutting all the time usually on you know two or four surfaces and uh, so you can move a lot of material for each rpm of that spindle uh, where versus the fly cutter which is doing very little work on each lap around okay we're almost ready to make some chips i know that's what you're waiting for but we need to talk uh, real briefly about uh, parallels because uh, parallels are essential on the mill you will need to buy a set of these right away the good news is here is that at least for the home hobbyist uh, the cheap sets of these are actually pretty decent and so the way these guys work is they typically come in a set and they're all the same thickness and then they range in height from and uh, this to this, whatever. Uh, they come in different sets, but um, uh, sort of a, a typical set like this is just fine. As you get into more and more different types of operations, you know, you'll want different kinds of parallels. You can get thicker ones, you can get really thin ones, you can get wavy ones. So there's lots of uh, special purpose uh, parallels. And here's an example of some of those specialty parallels I talked about. These are very thin parallels, great for working on small things as I often do. And uh, these were actually a viewer gift from Joe over at Sierra Specialty Auto. So thank you very much, Joe, and you should check him out. But uh, a real basic set like this, uh, which I will link to down in the description, won't set you back a lot of money and uh, will serve you pretty well. So what does pretty well look like? Uh, so here's one of those parallels and uh, well, let's see how parallel it actually is. I got a 10th style test indicator on there. And if I can keep from falling off the edge of this skinny little guy, you can see that uh, actually end to end there's maybe half a tenth uh, in there. So these things are actually pretty darn parallel. Now, the real secret though is they have to be a matched pair because you're frequently using two of them and if they aren't the same height, then uh, they aren't gonna be as precise. So let's see if they're skimping here on the matching of the pairs. So that guy was on zero. And that guy's also on zero, so not too bad. Not too bad at all. So again, you know, same amount of error. There's maybe a tenth uh, in, uh, in from one end to the other there. And uh, it's certainly within a tenth from one parallel to the other. So yeah, these, uh, these cheap guys are uh, honestly uh, not too bad, you know, for, for the money. This is certainly uh, enough precision for anything that we're gonna do here in the home shop.
So what are parallels actually for? Well, they allow us to translate a surface from one area to another. The most common use of that is in here in the vise. So recall that the fixed jaw of the vise is our precision reference surface on the machine, and the base of the vise is precisely oriented off of the fixed jaw at 90 degrees. So ideally, you always want your stock sitting down in this corner because this is a precise reference 90 degrees. However, the vice jaws are frequently too deep for the part that you want to work on, and so that's where the parallel comes in. By placing this parallel right in here, what we've done then is translated the base of the vise upwards to here, and by extension, we've translated the 90 degree reference corner that we had up to here. And so, again, assuming this parallel is precision ground, and we haven't introduced any error by doing this, then uh, we've now got a new precision fixed reference corner right here on the machine, and this happens to be a much more convenient place for us to work with. Now there's a lot more to know about proper use of parallels and uh, properly seating stock in the vise and how to square up stock. Uh, we're not going to talk about any of that right now. We're just here to make some chips and uh, so the quickest way to do that is just drop some parallels on there that are going to leave you enough vise jaw exposed to get a decent grip on your stock while still leaving you enough room to do some damage and then clamp down your vise and let's make some chips. Now again, I'm skipping a bunch of steps here for the proper way to seat stock in the vise when you're really actually trying to make something flat and square, okay? So save your comments, unless you wanna give me some engagement, but no, seriously, save your comments. <laughs> We're gonna get to the proper way to do all of this stuff. We're just here to make some chips. But wait a sec, what about that stock? What should you use for your first time out? You just wanna make some chips? You wanna have a little fun on your new toy? Uh, well, I'm going to refer you to the video on how to buy metal for the uh, lathe, and I think all of the same rules apply as far as, you know, what's good to start with, uh, with one exception, and that is aluminum. Recall that I recommended uh, uh, against aluminum for your first, you know, few tries on the lathe because uh, it, it's difficult to make it to break chips. It's very stringy, can be difficult to manage on the lathe. Uh, on, uh, on the mill, however, the interesting thing about the mill and multi-point cutters is that with a multi-point cutter, every cut is an interrupted cut. And what that means is that you don't have to worry about breaking chips. Your chips all break automatically because it's an interrupted cut. Every time that cut is interrupted, a chip has no choice but to form. So all of the disadvantages of aluminum vanish on the mill. And in fact, on the mill, aluminum is great for beginners because it doesn't need a ton of rigidity. It's really easy to work with and it's very easy to get really nice finishes on it. As this old Tony says, aluminum makes everyone look like a hero. And it's true because he's a smart guy. So aluminum, great choice for the beginner. Okay, so we're about ready to start cutting here, but the question now becomes, how do we know where to start and how deep to go? Well, this is algorithmically analogous to the first facing cut you make on the lathe. Uh, this first surface you create is gonna become your reference surface for the rest of the operations. But more importantly for, for this demonstration is you have to control your depth of cut. Now on a part like this, it's, it's pretty easy because there's a factory surface here and so it's relatively flat. But let's say you were trying to mill this sorry state of affairs and we've got a, a lousy bandsaw cut here and uh, you know someone went on break here and then came back and you've got a high spot over here and you've got a low spot right there and you've got maybe a medium high spot over here and a bit of a slope. So uh, depending on where you touch off and then how you set your depth of cut from there, you know, you could be cutting okay over here and then end up, you know, quite a bit too deep over here. So you need to take a good look at your surface and uh, you can generally eyeball where the high spot is and just make sure you touch off on the high spot and then set your depth of cut from there. And then after each pass, you can go down some amount uh, and know that you will never be going deeper than that amount after that first pass. And you don't necessarily want to try to clean it all up at once, you know, just like on the lathe, you might have to do multiple passes to get rid of all the low spots and that's okay. Uh, just focus on managing your depth of cut and not on trying to clean up in the fewest passes. But all right, we got this nice easy block of aluminum, so let's make some noise. So I'm gonna bring my column down and get in the ballpark of my surface. Machinists have very small ballparks, remember? And uh, now I'm going to kind of wind out my x-axis to the where the cutter is just kind of on the edge of my surface there. And uh, my x-axis is noisy. You're hearing the freewheeling of the spur gears on the power feed, so don't be alarmed by that. 
And now go just go ahead and set your RPM. And uh, you know this is now we're into speeds and feeds territory, which much like the lathe is is a, uh, a fine art and science on the mill as well, and it takes practice. But when you're first getting started, you know any end mill less than half an inch, 800 RPM is a good place to start, and you can play with it from there. Uh, larger face mill, yeah, start with 500, yeah, you'll probably be fine. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to feed down using the fine feed on my quill until I just touch off on that surface. We don't have far to go because we got it close with the column, so it should only be should only be you know 10 20 thou away from that surface. Okay, there we are there, and now I will wind it off the surface like so and then I can come up here to my quill DRO and zero that and now I can feed using the fine feed on my quill and set my depth of cut from here and uh, as we said in the first video in this series you know you can manage your depth of cut using the quill you don't have to go all the way to the column for every single thing and especially since we're milling aluminum we don't need maximum rigidity here so uh, now what we can do is just go ahead and uh, feed in some depth here so this is aluminum, it's really easy to cut, so we'll go 50 thou. And then you wanna always lock that quill. And note that the DRO did move a little when we locked the quill, and that's normal. Uh, everything moves a bit when you lock it, and that's just the nature of the beast. So if you need that depth to be precise, then unlock a little bit, adjust, lock it again until it lands on the measurement you want when it's locked. But we don't really care here, so we're just making some chips. Cutting fluid on the mill, always a good idea, just like on the lathe for aluminum. Uh, WD-40 makes a great cutting fluid, so I'll just get some of that on there. And now I'm just going to feed in by hand with my x-axis and uh, let's make some chips. And as far as feed speed goes, you know, once again, you're just trying to get the feel of it. Practice, 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 and you'll, you'll learn when it feels good and when the mill is working too hard or, you know, not hard enough. I'm going to pause here for a moment to talk about this situation here. Now, on the lathe, you don't have to worry about chip control because the chips always just fall away from the work. On the mill, however, they have a tendency like this to collect and sit on top. And uh, you really want to avoid recutting your chips. Uh, it's going to mess up your, your dimensions and it's hard on the end mills. And uh, if you're cutting something like steel, the chips may be harder than the actual stock is because of the heat. So uh, yeah, you want to avoid this situation. And uh, so you want to keep your chips clear. Now, the best way to do that is, of course, flood coolant, but most of us home gamers aren't equipped for that. So you can uh, blow them out of the way with air, you can hit them with uh, the WD-40 spray, uh, or you can pause and brush them out of the way as well. So uh, only certain kinds of operations is, is this going to happen. It's most prevalent with slot cutting like we're doing here. But um, yeah, just uh, you know, try, to, try to keep your chips uh, clear of the cutter, but by all means, do not get your hands in here to do that. Uh, if you have to uh, use a brush or get in there close, pause, pause the spindle and get in there and, and clean up your mess. And just like on the lathe, resist the urge to touch these chips with your hands because they are sharp and sometimes also very hot. So use a chip brush or compressed air or vacuum to clear your chips. And just like that, you are a mill operator. Okay, well, if you are following along with your new mill, you've now got it set up, you learned the basics, and you made some chips. So I hope we've, we've had some fun here along the way, but we've got a lot more to learn uh, in order to achieve anything approximating precision work, but we've got a, a base here that we can build on and uh, gradually improve our precision as we learn more and better techniques. So thank you very much for watching. Please do consider supporting me on Patreon, and we will see you next time.